Yes, it takes Zoom a minute or so to add everybody into the room. So please sit tight and we will get started in just a moment. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us. We're just giving Zoom another minute or so to add everybody into the room and then we will get started. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, Zoom's still adding people into the room. So we're gonna give a few more moments before we get started and then we'll jump right in. Thank you very much. Okay, hopefully Zoom has had an opportunity to have everybody and uh, anyone who joins late can catch up, I'm sure. We're going to go ahead and get started. We have a lot to get through. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Welcome to the latest Duke Media Briefing. I'm Greg Phillips with Duke Communications. On Friday, the US Supreme Court overturned almost 50 years of precedent that had guaranteed a constitutional right to an abortion. Trigger laws banning abortion are already taking effect in multiple states, creating a complicated and restrictive legal landscape for women seeking reproductive health care in this country. We have two Duke obstetrician gynecologists with us this morning, plus a legal expert to discuss the effects the ruling is already having on access to care. With us this morning is Dr. Beverly Gray. She is an obstetrician and gynecologist and founder of the Duke Reproductive Health Equity and Advocacy Mobilization Team. Also joining us is Dr. Jonas Swartz. He too is an obstetrician and gynecologist and a researcher in reproductive health equity issues. And we have Neil Siegel. He is a professor of law and a professor of political science at Duke University and a former clerk of Associate Supreme Court Justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Good morning, uh, good afternoon to you all panelists. Um, Dr. Gray, we'll start with you. Um, we discussed the possibility of this Supreme Court decision in a briefing last month. Now that it's a reality, what's your reaction as a human being and as a provider of reproductive health care? Thanks, Greg. Um, I think our community was definitely shocked and saddened on Friday, even though we were expecting this news. Um, but if it's okay with you, I'd like to speak for just a moment from a personal standpoint with my own thoughts and feelings as a person, as a physician who provides abortion care as part of comprehensive obstetrics and gynecology care. Um, I hold my patient stories very close to my heart and I've seen how access to abortion care can save lives. Abortion is common and my family is like many families in the U.S. who know or love someone who has had an abortion. Um, back in the early 1970s, my grandmother was diagnosed with an unplanned pregnancy and cervical cancer. And during the pre-Roe era, North Carolina was one of a handful of more progressive states, including California and Colorado. And those states allowed access to abortion in certain cases, including rape, incest, or maternal health risk. So my grandmother underwent a gravid hysterectomy, which removed her pregnancy, her uterus, her cervix, and the cervical cancer that was threatening her survival. And abortion saved her life. Um, like most people seeking abortion today, my grandmother was already a mother. Um, she was poor and access to contraception was challenging in the late 1960s. She didn't have a high school diploma, but she worked hard in a second shift factory job to provide for her family. And um, my dad and his sister were able to go to college. She had a great sense of humor. She had an infectious laugh. And she was a woman of strong faith. She loved God and her family very deeply. And because of her abortion, she lived to meet her grandchildren. And I can tell you that I'm a better person today by having had her in my life. As an individual obstetrician gynecologist, I provide abortion care for patients facing a variety of life circumstances. Some are like my grandmother, managing a life-threatening diagnosis. Some have strongly desired pregnancies with diagnoses of lethal birth defects. But many patients are simply seeking autonomy over their lives and their health. And pregnancy is not part of what they envision for their future. While I will never meet the physician that cared for my grandmother and saved her life, I'm grateful for the care they provided. And I worry right now that at some point in the future, I will be hindered from saving lives like, the, like my grandmother's. Um, so I think there are a lot of feelings right now, Greg, and I think, um, you know, we're, we started our new intern orientation today for our new OBGYNs um, pursuing this 
amazing field of medicine. And there are a lot of uncertainties around what their training will look like. Um, so I'm really thankful that we have this time to answer some questions, to get out evidence-based information about abortion care um, so that folks can have a better understanding of the potential impacts for the people in our state. Sure, absolutely. Thank you very much, Dr. Gray. And Dr. Swartz, you're a father, and like Dr. Gray, you provide a range of reproductive health care to many, many patients. Um, would you like to speak for, for a moment on what this means to you on a personal and professional level to have such a profound change in the, in the medical landscape? Yeah, thank you, Greg. Um, and thanks, Dr. Gray, for sharing that story. It's powerful every time I hear it. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, Greg, you know, I'm a father. And so when this ruling came, um, you know, came across, it, we I was prepared for it. Um, and it still was quite a gut punch. Um, and when I think about the impact on our society and the impact for my kids, it's devastating. And it makes me really sad um, that before Friday, we lived in a country that afforded people or where this right was a component, you know, part of the fabric of our nation and part of the one of the rights that we could count on. Um, people could make their own reproductive choices and help them live their lives in the productive way that they chose. Um, and so it makes me really sad that people are losing that choice. You know, um, the reason that I went into OBGYN, like Dr. Gray, was that I enjoyed sharing these moments of great happiness and also supporting people in moments of great sadness, right? It's an amazing career where you get to participate in a spectrum of emotions and a spectrum of medical experiences with people. Um, and doing abortion care for that reason is really affirming care. You are able to sit down with someone, help them come to a decision that's right for their life. And then in providing either a medication abortion with pills or providing a procedural abortion, you can in five to 15 minutes, help them achieve something that they want to in the future, help them uh, you know, treat a medical problem. And that is really, really gratifying. It's an honor to be involved in people's lives like that. Um, so when I think about my colleagues across the country who share my passion for reproductive health care and now live in states where that care is illegal, I feel sad for them and more importantly, feel sad for their patients that now they have to jump through so many hurdles to get that essential care. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Swartz. And um, Professor Siegel, as we move on to you, Dr. Swartz just mentioned, as we know now, uh, we have a country in which uh, abortion is legal in some states and illegal in others. Um, and I think one of the, the most pressing questions that seems to have emerged since Friday is that, are there uh, potential legal consequences for women who cross state lines to get an abortion um, under this new, new environment, or, and indeed for the people that help them? Is that clear? Uh, or could there be uh, consequences at the state level um, for women who do that? Oh, well, thanks uh, so much for that question. And uh, I will answer, answer it. Let me, let me say first that uh, you mentioned that I, I, I clerk for Justice Ginsburg. I think uh, more important than that is uh, what a good friend she was to my two teenage daughters and uh, to uh, many, many teenage daughters who never had the privilege of knowing her. Uh, she made us better by understanding uh, that the Constitution is best understood to slowly include within its brace, embrace people who long didn't count or count for much in constituting we the people. Uh, she looked at American society and asked it to take seriously the idea that women are people too, and they count. Uh, and we've been hearing for a very long time now that uh, those who oppose abortion, and I respect uh, my fellow Americans who have very different views than I do on the moral status of a fetus, uh, but we've been hearing for a very long time now that they're not anti-women. And uh, it is absolutely heartbreaking uh, that we're going to find out uh, what that means, uh, 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 the, the restrictions that are going to be imposed, uh, and the invasions of, of bodily integrity that we're about to endure, uh, what it means uh, for the state to coerce childbirth um, now, uh, as far as the court is concerned, from the moment of conception. Uh, in terms of your question, uh, there are uh, going to be states uh, that seek to prohibit not just abortion within their own borders, 
uh, but prohibit residents of their states from traveling out of state to obtain an abortion and then to return home, as well as those who uh, help them uh, financially or otherwise to do that. Uh, this is not a crystal clear legal landscape. Uh, one would have to go back to the days uh, of slavery to get the closest legal analogy I can think about in which you have a country deeply divided over a moral question and states are trying to regulate conduct that happens not just within their borders, but outside of it. There are some other analogies if we were talking about bootlegging or, or, or but, but, not, but nothing on the, uh, on the scale uh, of, of what we're talking about right now. And I'm not saying the abortion debate is just like the slavery debate, but uh, these are not normal legal times. Uh, this does not happen very often that you have states trying to regulate conduct uh, uh, that takes place outside their own jurisdictions. I can tell you that the Supreme Court has protected what's called the right to travel. It's not mentioned in the Constitution. It's unenumerated, uh, like the right to abortion uh, that the court has now said no longer uh, exists. Uh, but the court has protected it going back to 1849, the right to travel in the passenger cases, 1868, a case called Crandall against Nevada. These decisions were reaffirmed as recently as 1999 in a case called Sands against Roe. And there are various components of the right to travel. The one that's most relevant to your question uh, and most relevant uh, to pregnant uh, people who are seeking uh, reproductive health care out of state because they can't get it in their own state is, is the right to, to enter and leave other states. And um, I can, with uh, some measure of confidence, count to five on this Supreme Court to say that states are not permitted uh, to prohibit their own residents from going out of state to obtain an abortion. The three dissenters, uh, Justices Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan, and I assume Justice Jackson, who will soon replace Justice Breyer, is going to agree I think they'll agree that it would violate the right to travel for states to do that. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh, in his concurring opinion in Dobbs, went out of his way, uh, and I have it right before me, to say, uh, may a state bar a resident of that state from traveling to another based on the constitutional right uh, 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 to uh, go out of state to obtain an abortion? And my view, the answer is no, based on the constitutional right to interstate travel. So that's a fourth vote, and Chief Justice Roberts uh, who uh, did not join Justice Alito's majority opinion, did not think the court should entirely overrule Roe and Casey, uh, I would expect would agree with Justice Kavanaugh. So I expect there are five votes on the Supreme Court for the proposition that states cannot prohibit their residents from going out of state uh, to obtain uh, an abortion. Uh, but I can't tell you that there's a precedent on point. The court has not, to my knowledge, decided a case in which interstate travel is not simply banned, but banned for certain purposes. So there are arguments on the other side about what the scope of the right to travel is. Uh, but uh, if, I were, if I were betting, I would bet that there are, um, there are five votes on uh, even this court uh, to uh, restrict the state's ability to do that. And as a practical matter, uh, um, I, think, I think it would be extremely difficult in most circumstances, although not necessarily all, for a state to go about uh, enforcing such a ban uh, given that the sister state that allows access to abortion is, is not going to be uh, cooperating with any kind of uh, criminal, criminal law enforcement. Now, having said that, uh, doctors who help patients travel out of state to obtain abortions, um, you know, uh, uh, who is in charge of the medical licensing boards within the state that, that bans abortion? Uh, are they, uh, 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 what kind of rules are they imposing? What kind of restrictions are they imposing on doctors? I think that's something uh, that physicians are going to need need to look out for in the uh, the days and, and months and, and years ahead. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Professor Siegel, for that comprehensive overview. And as the uh, parent of a teenage daughter myself, I appreciate your recollections of uh, Justice Ginsburg and the relationship she had with your daughters. Um, we're going to open it up to questions now. Thank you to everybody who submitted questions in advance. We have a lot and we'll get through as many of them as we can. You can also post questions via the Q&A window at any time. If you would like to ask a question in person, please raise your hand in Zoom and we will unmute you when your turn comes around. If you're calling in by phone, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine. Um, Dr. Gray, I'd like to come back to you, and Professor Siegel just alluded to this. Can you talk a little bit about 
um, the impact of this decision on your profession, on people coming into this profession, and those of you who are currently practicing, albeit yourself and Dr. Swartz are currently in North Carolina, a state that currently does not prohibit abortion, but uh, of course thousands upon thousands of doctors are now operating in states where uh, it's not entirely certain, I guess, what care they can provide legally. What What is the kind of shock to your profession that this ruling um, has brought about, in, at least in the short term? I think it's uh, a topic of conversation amongst uh, professionals, um, a variety of different professional societies um, and how we respond, how we move forward. You know, I think um, the system in which abortion care in this country was possible, um, even with Roe in place was problematic. And we could see huge disparities based on what state you lived in and the type of care you could access or whether or not you had um, insurance coverage to pay for that care. And so I think um, people have already been dealing with these problems practically. I think the, there are a couple of questions that come to my mind. I mean, I think I worry about how this will impact who will go into this field of medicine, you know, worrying about some of the things that um, that Neil talked about as far as, you know, will we be prosecuted for providing the care that's right for a patient? If we have a patient and we live in a state where we can't provide emergency care and we help them seek emergency care in another state, could we be prosecuted? I mean, these are real questions that may come up sooner rather than later. And I think the field is moving so quickly. Um, in some states, you know, I have colleagues and friends all across the country who are, are texting me updates um, that are just unbelievable. Um, and so, you know, 10 years ago when I, when I became an OBGYN and finished residency, could I have ever imagined a day that uh, Roe would not be in place? No. I mean, I think these are, you know, we have a lot of reasons to say these are unprecedented times, but absolutely this is unprecedented for medical trainees. And so I'm hoping that medical students who are fired up about this issue that want to protect um, reproductive health rights will be inspired to join the field, but I do worry that it will impact the number of people pursuing OBGYN in general, the number of people that will apply to our program being in a state where right now we have the ability to provide care, but what will happen, you know, after the next governor's election, after, you know, um, the next legislative elections, we, we, there's just a lot of uncertainty. So, um, I don't know that I necessarily answered your question, but I think we're, um, there's just a lot of uncertainty. Things are moving quickly and I don't know. I, I think we're, um, we're all in crisis mode right now, trying to figure out how we move forward, how we're able to provide the care that's safe and, and right for patients. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and to add to that, Dr. Swartz, just so we're clear on some of the stakes we're talking about here, what are some of the medical risks to women? Um, in places where safe and legal abortion is no longer available? Well, so I, I think one of the most challenging circumstances that um, Bev alluded to is these cases of medical emergency or medically indicated abortion. And so we very commonly um, see people in our clinics who have some medical condition that means that abortion is safer for them than carrying the pregnancy to term. Now, abortion, we should say overall, abortion is really safe and abortion is safer than childbirth. Um, but for these people, it is particularly risky to carry on with a pregnancy. And, you know, in many cases, it's a very, you know, it can be a sad situation for them because they, you know, this can be a highly desired pregnancy, which they're terminating for their own health. Um, back to the challenge, you know, I think the challenge figuring out, well, what degree of medical risk is enough that you decide that it is a medical emergency? You know, what do you define as a threat to maternal life? Um, is it a 1% risk of death? Is it a 30% risk of death? Is it a 50% risk of death? Do you have to wait for someone to be actively dying, actively having their organs shut down or have a life-threatening infection before you can intervene? Or if you suspect that those things would happen, can you intervene before that? Um, you know, I think we are trained to provide evidence-based medical care. And this is the only circumstance where I can think of that 
the, that states are taking away our ability to provide best evidence-based care. We know how to care for these patients and we know how to help them make decisions that are best for their lives and for their health. Um, and so we're put in a precarious circumstance and our hands are tied and we're not able to either provide the counseling or more importantly, provide the care that's life-saving. Um, you know, I think that the other risk is people who we know that abortion exist and people will still need abortions, even if it is illegal in their state. And so people will seek abortion and get abortions, even if it is illegal in their state. And so some people will be able to obtain abortions through safe means by traveling to other states. Uh, they may be able to safely order medication pills that are the same pills that we would use if we were performing a medication abortion on the internet. They may be able to get an online consultation um, to do medication abortion remotely. But other people will resort to unsafe means for abortion. Um, and that means that we are going to be seeing more people in our emergency departments or in our clinics who have you know, incomplete abortions or infections and uh, may have complications related to that. And so I think we're, you know, we're really putting women's lives at peril or pregnant people's lives at peril by taking away this right. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Professor Siegel, coming back to you, we've had a number of questions about the situation here in North Carolina. There was a 20 week ban on abortion that was overturned. And we've got a number of questions about what, um, whether that's likely to return and what steps would have to occur in order for that ban to be imposed. Can you talk us a little bit through the legal landscape there? Sure. Uh, and this is actually, uh, you would think there would be an obvious, straightforward answer to all of this, but it, there's not a lot of case law. I was able to find a uh, a case from DC going back to uh, the 50s, but this is this is the way I I understand it, which is uh, that Judge Osteen, uh, I, I believe it was March 25 of 2019, he uh, entered uh, an injunction. He enjoined that North Carolina law from uh, operating insofar as it prohibited uh, abortion uh, before fetal viability. And so what would have to happen now, uh, I, I think the best view is uh, not for the legislature to need to repass it, uh, but that for the litigants uh, in that case to go back to court, to go back to Judge Osteen and uh, ask based on Dobbs that the injunction he uh, previously uh, imposed be, be dissolved. And uh, the statute after the dissolution of the federal court injunction that would come back into effect. Gotcha, absolutely. Thank you uh, very much for that. Um, Dr. Gray, coming back, we've had a number uh, of questions involving uh, abortion pills. These are obviously, you know, de demand has already started to skyrocket. And we've had a number of questions for what the process is, just particularly for a woman in North Carolina, uh, and right now, what kind of circumstances those are usually prescribed and how uh, a woman goes about actually, you know, acquiring them. So there are two options for uh, first trimester abortion, um, either a medication pill or abortion pill or a procedure in the clinic. Um, and patients have a variety of reasons why they might choose one option versus the other. Um, both the abortion pill and the procedure, they're the same um, it's the same process if you were to come into our clinic with a miscarriage, we would manage it the same way with the same medications and the same exact procedure. And so for, for folks who are seeking a medication um, or, or an abortion pill um, to manage their um, early pregnancy, um, they can have that up through 11 weeks of pregnancy. Um, in North Carolina, there's a 72 hour waiting period. So patients would have to call their clinic, uh, would have to undergo uh, state mandate, mandated counseling that has to be provided by um, a medical provider, either a nurse or physician or nurse practitioner, um, and then wait 72 hours for an appointment. Um, typically, they come in and they um, are seen in clinic and go through a lot of information and counseling about the process. They take a, a pill in the clinic uh, that's given by the physician. Um, and then they use a medication at home, which causes a problem similar to a spontaneous miscarriage. Um, and probably close to 50% of people in the U.S. are choosing medication um, abortion to manage um, to manage their early pregnancies. And when they choose abortion, 
And um, it's a very, very safe process. I think, you know, one thing we've talked about before is that, you know, in the 1960s and early 70s, um, the abortion pill was not an option for people. And so um, they didn't have access to this very safe um, mechanism for, um, for having care. And, and now they do. And so, you know, I think when people talk about, you know, the risk of unsafe abortion and kind of going back to how things were like in the kind of late 60s, early 70s, I'm very hopeful that that's not the case in states that have restrictive bans, because if folks are still able to access medication abortion, which you can still receive, um, there's some states through the mail um, that you can, can receive that. In North Carolina, there is a ban on telemedicine uh, for providing um, the abortion pill, although there's a lot of data to suggest that you can safely provide that um, via telemedicine. Um, so that's a, a lot of information, but essentially it's a safe process. We're very lucky that we have this um, have this in place now for patients, um, because for some patients, it's the option that they that they prefer. Absolutely. Thank you. And Professor Siegel, bouncing back to you, you know, we've, we've addressed the question of people crossing state lines. Obviously, there's a lot of questions about, you know, abortion pills being ordered from within a state where abortion is illegal from a state where it is legal. Um, do you anticipate what, what do you anticipate uh, the kind of legal maneuvering that might happen around that, given that I guess it's extremely difficult to to regulate mail coming into a state as a practical matter? But would you expect that states within uh, states that are currently banned abortion might make moves to ban the acquisition of abortion pills for women within their state? Uh, I would I would expect that uh, the, uh, the FDA has uh, allowed uh, the interstate uh, uh, shipment of uh, abortion uh, inducing pills. And um, uh, uh, I think it'd be very, very important uh, t- uh, for uh, the proliferation on the internet uh, and otherwise of accurate information about uh, how, how they should be used. Uh, I, I fear a lot of misinformation uh, is gonna proliferate on, uh, on the internet, uh, but I would expect states that uh, ban abortion uh, to also uh, criminalize uh, receiving it uh, 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 via interstate shipment, uh, not every state necessarily. I don't. I don't know the future uh, any 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 better than anyone anyone else. But uh, uh, it, it seems to it stands to reason uh, in my mind at least that uh, states that are intent on uh, uh, criminally prohibiting abortion are not going to allow uh, uh, um, uh, uh, safe, effective medication to induce. Uh, abortion, or at least many of them won't. And um, I've been uh, trying to think about uh, potential uh, legal challenges uh, to those uh, uh, state laws if if I'm right that they they end up being passed. And I should say that this is, again, uh, this is not normal territory in which I can cite uh, case law and you know past situations in which this has happened in, in modern, constitutional law, one possibility that comes uh, to mind would be some kind of argument based on federal preemption. Uh, For those who know anything about preemption, the idea that valid federal law trumps inconsistent state law, uh, it would be obstacle preemption. Could you make the argument that uh, the FDA's uh, approval uh, of these drugs and uh, its uh, approval of their interstate shipment uh, that these state laws would would stand as an obstacle to uh, the achievement of uh, the statutory objectives that the FDA is implementing. Uh, I do think there is a plausible argument under under the the court's preemption doctrine uh, that that uh, obstacle preemption would be uh, would would be an available argument. But having said that, I am not at all um, confident that there are five justices on the current court who would. Uh, who would agree uh, uh, with that assessment? There, there, uh, there are um, really six who are uh, skeptical of uh, the power of the modern administrative state, and there are a variety of doctrines that could be invoked uh, uh, to support the conclusion that uh, Congress can authorize this, but the FDA uh, cannot. There's something called the major questions doctrine. Uh, there's something called the non-delegation doctrine, which the court, I think, is trying to to reinvigorate. And so uh, there is a potential preemption argument, but I'm not nearly as confident as I am uh, with respect to your earlier question that there are five votes on the Supreme Court uh, that would uh, that would uh, uh, support the argument. 
Absolutely, thank you. Dr. Swartz, uh, this question might be uh, premature, but we've been asked it, so I'll pass it along. Um, and reports wondering whether you're seeing any reaction amongst patients so far. Obviously, this is the first full day uh, of, of regular week, week work day since the ruling came through. But what kind of reaction have you seen and what would you expect? Do you expect to see an increase in you know, requests for birth control pills, this kind of thing? Do you, do you have any sense yet for how um, the women you treat with reproductive health care are reacting to this or being affected by it? Well, I mean, I think it's really important to emphasize that abortion is legal in North Carolina. So, so the care that we provided on Thursday is the same as the care we provided on Friday and today. Um, but I do think that it makes people scared, right? I mean, the there is a lot of, you know, blaming in terms of who is seeking abortion and, you know, why they would need an abortion, right? Um, and I think we can all identify with having done something, it made a mistake, for example, you know, so um, there's good evidence to show that even experts in reproductive health care have had unprotected sex when they were not intending to get pregnant. Um, there is, you know, we all have eaten something that we didn't intend to. Um, and so I think we need to be supportive of the fact that um, people need to have options to help manage their life outcomes. Um, and abortion is one of those. Um, so I, I think people are potentially feeling the erosion of that right um, and the erosion of that freedom and are are worried about, you know, what that means for the future and whether they need more reliable um, uh, birth control. But the other element, I think, is that it's really confusing, right? So if you ask me right now to draw on a map what states now in which in which states is abortion illegal? And I care about this a lot. Would I be able to fill out that map correctly? No. Um, and I did some research uh, that was a national, um, nationally representative sample of reproductive age women, and women had very low knowledge about their state's abortion laws. Um, over a third of participants in that study uh, were not able to accurately describe any of their state's abortion laws. So uh, I would imagine that people are pretty confused about the care that they can seek in their state. Um, and so I think it's going to be very important that we message correct information about the care in each state, that we publicly share that information. And to allude back to a point earlier, I'm really worried about disinformation about that, right? I mean, I read a story about crisis pregnancy centers um, or a protest, protesting crisis pregnancy center um, uh, staff outside a clinic saying abortion was now illegal when it was in fact legal inside that clinic. Um, and so, you know, I worry about that sort of misinformation about the legal status as well. Uh, and I think, you know, people are really vulnerable to all sorts of misinformation. And so that, that makes it scary and makes it so much, so much more important that we all are providing accurate information for people who are seeking healthcare. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, related to that, Dr. Gray, um, as it stands right now, North Carolina is one of relatively few southeastern states where abortion remains legal. Um, do you expect a big influx of people crossing state lines uh, to get abortion? And, and do we have the medical infrastructure to be able to, to handle that? I think we are anticipating that volumes will increase. We've already seen that volumes have increased over these past few months as more restrictive bans have been put in place in states like Texas and Oklahoma there is sort of this tidal wave effect of patients in those states going to nearby states. And then in those nearby states, there are delays in care because all the appointments are taken from folks out of state. Um, and so we are anticipating that there will be an increase in need uh, for patients in the Southeast and um, North Carolina may be the, the first spot um, kind of on I-95 for people in the South that are, that are needing care. Um, you know, I think we're, we're worried that in South Carolina that they're moving quickly to enact a more restrictive ban and, um, and those patients will be needing care. Um, so I think um, we are, we're already thinking about this. We have been thinking about this for a few months and how we can um, expand the care that we offer so that we can be positioned to provide health care for the patients that need it. Obviously, our priority is caring for the people in our community and the people in our state, but, you know, we, we want to help as many people as we can because we know that um, abortion is life-saving, it's life-altering, and restricting access forces people to continue their pregnancies to delivery, leaving them um, facing the health risk of pregnancy, 
Um, and barriers to abortion uh, exacerbate the disparities that already exist in our, in our country. Um, and barriers that limit abortion access disproportionately affect communities um, of color. And we know that in our country, black women are already facing a more maternal mortality rate that's three times higher than that of, of white women. And when we limit access to abortion, we force people to carry pregnancies to term and face those risks. And so if, if we can expand access and provide care, um, that's, that's the right thing to do. Absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Uh, Professor Siegel, coming back to you, we've had a question about how HIPAA could play a role in this. Could HIPAA protect those who defy state anti-abortion laws? Can HIPAA be affected by last week's ruling? And could it be strengthened to protect patients and providers? That's a, a lot of questions. Um, but do you think that, that HIPAA is going to be a significant factor um, in, in how this plays out? Well, I'm thinking uh, specifically about the context of uh, you have a, a pregnant person who travels interstate uh, to obtain reproductive health care because uh, their home state doesn't uh, allow it. And uh, it's brought to the intention of uh, a local prosecutor uh, who wants to uh, um, prosecute uh, the individual for violating, I'm hypothesizing now a state law prohibiting uh, the interstate travel for purposes of obtaining an abortion or for aiding and abetting, um, to use legal language, the procurement uh, of, of an abortion. And uh, as a practical matter, uh, I think those prosecutions would be very difficult in most cases to pull off because of a lack of evidence. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the prosecutor could ask uh, uh, the, uh, the doctor's office or the state in which uh, the abortion occurred uh, for uh, relevant evidence or documentation. But I don't imagine states that continue to provide access to reproductive health care are going to cooperate, uh, nor uh, would they be required to. And moreover, to get to your question, I could see uh, HIPAA uh, uh, protecting uh, the, medical, uh, the medical privacy of, uh, of the patient who, who obtained the abortion. Now, I am no HIPAA expert. Um, I even sign the forms every time I go to Duke Hospital and don't read uh, uh, the HIPAA consent form, uh, but it does provide a substantial federal protection for medical privacy. And uh, I would imagine, although I don't know, uh, that it could be strengthened even more, although um, I don't see that happening in Congress without uh, um, the termination of, of the Senate filibuster as to, as to legislation, uh, given disagreements about uh, abortion uh, between the two, uh, the two parties in, in Congress. But I would uh, expect, again, without being a HIPAA expert, that uh, medical privacy, as well as just the uh, refusal to cooperate of sister states that provide access to reproductive health care, uh, would provide a lot of legal and practical uh, protection uh, to people who do travel interstate to obtain an abortion. Absolutely, thank you. Um, and certainly we will be uh, having briefings in the day and weeks to come to address some of the political aspects of this. Uh, Dr. Swartz, for the moment, I'd like to come back to you. We've had a number of questions on um, how this could affect in vitro fertilization, uh, those pregnancies and care of those women. Can you speak a little bit to that topic? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a very interesting area and challenging area. Um, so in in vitro fertilization, an egg and a sperm Sperm are joined outside, um, you know, outside a person's body. They're, you know, it's test, make a test tube baby and you make an embryo. And then sometimes they test some of the cells in those embryos to determine um, whether they are likely to carry on and be successful pregnancies. Um, and frequently in in vitro fertilization, they produce more embryos than someone needs for the pregnancies that they are planning to carry forwards. And then they leave those embryos frozen. And so um, does this mean now that, so if we're saying that, well, the medical definition of pregnancy is uh, both sperm and egg joining and then implantation. Um, and so, but it appears that many who, um, certainly the, there is a religious belief that I've heard um, branded about as science, where people say that it is in fact the egg and the sperm meeting that, um, uh, is conception. So that is the beginning of life. So then does that mean that when you destroy those em embryos, you are committing murder? Um, 
I would think that if your logic applies to applies that sort of thinking to abortion, then wouldn't it apply to in vitro fertilization? Um, will people have to change their practice so that they can only create as many embryos as they wish to transfer? Um, you know, I think that um, if the reason that people create more embryos is because they want to help people be as successful as possible when they're having difficulty with fertility and do so with the least number of treatments possible. And so you, again, would be hindering people's ability to provide sort of, you know, evidence-based best medicine to help them achieve fertility. Um, really interested in unintended consequence, um, but certainly would need to be the carryover in terms of the same, you, you would apply the same standard, I would think. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't know that the states that have abortion bans on the books are thinking that through or have thought that through. You know, many of these trigger laws were passed um, either uh, many years ago, you know, they're either reenacting laws that were passed prior to Roe or even in the 1800s, or um, they were passed against a backstop of Roe versus Wade. So, you know, maybe it's just my hope in my heart of hearts that the that in fact, the legislators too, who passed those bans wanted to message for their constituents, but maybe didn't believe that abortion should be banned in all circumstances, including rape and incest, right? Um, but uh, and so they weren't thinking through all of the consequences of their actions because they didn't appreciate at the time that, that or didn't think at the time that this would ever become law. Well, now it is law. And so it's time to think through these eventualities and figure out, um, OK, you're going to regulate this in this way. What's your plan um, and how are you going to apply it? And are we going to be able to provide any of the care that we think is state of the art? I mean, you know, when I think the Dr. Gray mentioned earlier that abortion is common. So one in four women will have an abortion before age 45. You know, diabetes is also common. Um, about 30% of Amer 33% of Americans will have diabetes. So, you know, prevalence in the same ballpark. Um, if we just said, you know what, you can't treat diabetes in your state anymore. I don't believe in that. You have to travel multiple states to get your diabetes care. Would that seem reasonable? And then how would we care for those people, right? We're, we've created the same logistical problem now for many, many people across the United States. Uh, and it, I, don't, I don't think that, we've, that the people who are passing these laws have thought through all of those areas of medicine, uh, which supports the idea that um, we as doctors train very hard to be able to support our patients um, and help them make decisions in the exam room. And I don't think personally that a legislator or legislators are gonna improve that care that I provide. Um, and we know there is excellent data that restrictions on abortion care don't do anything to improve the quality or the safety of the care. They only make more difficult to access. Um, unfortunately, there are some downstream consequences and now there will be other types of care that are more difficult to provide and more difficult to access as well. Absolutely, thank you very much. Um, Professor Gray, coming back, uh, Dr. Gray, coming back to you, um, you know, we've seen, obviously, there are a number of, uh, as Dr. Swartz mentioned, the, the laws in different um, states vary. There are some uh, abortion bans that make exceptions when there is a uh, risk to the life of the mother. But can you talk a little bit about the fact that there are sometimes immediate risks to the life of the mother, and then there are long-term health risks to the life of the mother that could shorten a life, and that makes that you know, an oversimplification, and how that complicates the ability to provide care? Well, I think you hit on a lot of those points. Um, Exactly right. I, I think it's hard. It's hard enough to um, to do our job some days, but then to have to decide: Is this patient's life at risk enough for me to care for them? Am I going to put myself at risk um, to care for a patient? Is it there's a, there's so many shades of gray in medicine, and we know that pregnancy um, is riskier than an abortion, just in general. Um, and forcing people to continue pregnancy, is that risky enough, um, for their health? I think some people would say yes. Um, other people would say, well, you know, it needs to be more of immediate risk. You know, they need to be bleeding to death or severely infected or something needs to be happening. Um, but if you've made it to that point, it's really risky. Even in those cases, you're, um, 
you're not guaranteed that you're going to save a life if you wait until that patient is at the brink of death. And so that's not fair to people either. Um, and so it's these shades of gray where, you know, a lot of people think, well, you know, a 20 week band, that sounds reasonable, right? But, you know, at 20 weeks, a patient might just be developing enough impacts from their heart disease or their cardiomyopathy or their other underlying medical issues that are causing them to have organ failure that are causing them to need to be in the ICU to stay alive. And so by simplifying it, say, okay, we'll make a 20 week ban. There are all those patients that fall into that window where it's very difficult to make the determination of when is the risk enough. Um, and we just need to be providing evidence-based care to our patients, but instead we're forced to learn the law in ways that I never would have anticipated having to learn the law when I went to medical school. I went to medical school. I did not go to law school. Um, and so now I'm having to learn all these new things. Am I going to have to call up a lawyer to make a decision for a patient? That just seems like an extra step that puts people's lives at risk. Thank you very much, Dr. Gray. Professor Siegel, uh, you did go to law school. Uh, we have another a few questions about the legal aspects of this, one of which is whether it would make any difference if President Biden declared a public health emergency um, under the law. Would that provide um, any additional flexibility for him to um, expand access to abortion care without congressional um, action? Uh, are you aware of how much wriggle room that would give the president if he chose to act? So I'm not I'm not aware of any power the president has to declare a public health emergency that would override or preempt state legislation restricting access to abortion. Now, there, 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 a declaration of a public health emergency uh, uh, could could empower the president uh, to enhance uh, access to care in states that uh, permit it and perhaps uh, provide resources to pregnant people who want to travel uh, yeah, interstate or uh, receive uh, abortion medication via the mail. Uh, so there, there, there would be some flexibility there to help, um, uh, but, I, but it, it wouldn't be the kind of thing that uh, there is a federal statute that's given the president the authority to declare a public health emergency that would override state uh, criminal restrictions on, on access uh, to abortion. Federal law doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't do that. Not that it couldn't. Uh, Congress uh, could legislate one way or the other using its powers to regulate interstate uh, commerce among, uh, among others, but, but Congress, has not, uh, Congress has not done that. Uh, something else I, want, I wanted to say, I talked earlier about the importance of uh, uh, pro uh, promulgating accurate information about, about medication abortion and, and how it's used. I would say the same thing about what the law is. And I'm thinking of uh, uh, Dr. Swartz's comments a, a little while ago. Uh, it's going to be very important for people uh, to know what the law of their state is. So let me just say for North Carolina, uh, abortion uh, is legal in this state now. The, the North Carolina law has not yet gone back into effect. And even after it goes into effect, it's not a prohibition on abortion from the moment of conception. Uh, it's uh, 20, uh, 20 weeks. Uh, and then even after 20 weeks, there are exceptions for an immediate risk uh, to life or impairment of a major bodily function. Now, what all of that means, uh, to speak to what Dr. Gray just said, uh, I do think uh, there are going to be uh, uh, right, uh, many more lawyers and, and hospitals like Duke's uh, advising many more doctors. Uh, about uh, what such language in different state laws uh, uh, means, and it might not mean the same thing in every state. Absolutely, thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Swartz, coming back to you, Professor Siegel just mentioned the, uh, the previous and likely to at least be an attempt to reimpose this 20-week ban in North Carolina. Can you talk a little bit about the, the problems with that from a, from a provider standpoint? Yeah, so the vast majority of abortion occurs in the first trimester. 90% um, of abortion care is in the first trimester, is 
excuse me, 90% of abortion care is in the first eight weeks of pregnancy. And the abortion becomes increasingly rare as we go along in gestational age. So you might think, oh, well, what's the problem with a, a 20 week ban? Well, one circumstance are these medical circumstances where people need an abortion and um, there already is a carve out in the law that would allow us to intervene there. The other circumstance that we commonly see is people who have a fetal condition that is diagnosed at that point in pregnancy that needs to be treated. And before the 20 week ban was enjoined. That meant that people would get their anatomy ultrasound, which is often a very, very happy occasion. The doctors would see some anomaly or some change and the couple would immediately have to make a decision about whether they wanted to move forward with termination because the clock was ticking. Um, and so you're putting families that are already in this very difficult and devastating situation now in this falsely imposed time pressure um, there's nothing special about 20 weeks in terms of development of the fetus. There's no special function that has been discovered about uh, the sort of fetal well-being at that time. Abortion does it does not cause pain to fetuses. Um, fetuses can't feel pain prior to 28 weeks. So this is just a, a arbitrarily designated state-imposed risk that um, you know has was historically imposed. Uh, so we really need to, to provide full spectrum care to people. We, we need to have that option. Um, and so, you know, reinstating that ban, which I, I understand why it's likely that it will happen. Um, and I strongly oppose it. It's why, um, you know, my colleagues challenged that law um, because it was so important for us to be able to provide care in those circumstances and not have people have to leave the state to get that care. So, I mean, we have some experience with people needing to leave the state to get care. Um, and, you know, it's it, it's really limiting. It's really inconvenient. It really puts a tremendous burden on people. Um, though, you know, the this sort of undue burden standard is no longer where we're where we're looking in the real world. Putting that burden on people is is horrible. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Um, appreciate everybody sending in questions. We're getting through as many of them as we can. Although we will be wrapping up here shortly. Um, Dr. Gray, uh, you, you touched upon this earlier, but we had a direct question about it. Could you talk a little bit about how restrictions on abortion tend to enhance healthcare inequities for people of color and, and, and broaden the gap in, in access to reproductive healthcare more generally? Right, so we, we talked a little bit earlier about how um, in our country right now, we have a maternal mortality crisis. And if you're a black woman in this country, your risk of death during pregnancy is three times higher than white women. So there is, a, you know, we are struggling with, you know, how do we help patients um, reduce his risk during pregnancy and how do we combat the racism that exists in our system at all levels to improve maternal health care. Um, and so patients who are facing um, a pregnancy and know that their life is, is at greater risk may make the decision to, to end their pregnancy. And, you know, I think every single person that we care for is an expert in their own lives. And, you know, what those conversations that happen in the exam room are, you know, not, people don't understand kind of what people are facing, the challenges that they're facing whether they're financial challenges, you know, more than half of people seeking an abortion already have kids that they want to be around to take care of, that they want to live for. Um, and so, you know, we have to, we have to respect the expertise of the patients that are seeking care. And I think, you know, there's been a lot of, you know, sadness and distress around this ruling, but I think there are also some areas of hope. You know, there are communities that, can be the experts in how we restructure, how we provide care in this country. And that gives me hope that there are people out there that are experts in their lives that can, that can help us create solutions that impact the people that need them the most. And, you know, I think we've cobbled together the system relying on Roe and now we're facing a different challenge and we just need different tools, different experts. We need the communities that are impacted the most to be at the table. We need to listen to stories of people who have had abortions, because I think what happens is that, you know, we talk about this in the abstract and we forget the humanity, the, the lives that are impacted every single day 
of people that we're caring for. And until that can be unveiled, until the shame and stigma around abortion can be unveiled and people can really have an understanding, we're going to continue to struggle. And so I try to be an optimist and I'm hopeful that through all of this, through this horrible ruling, through the worsening of these disparities, that we're going to come out of this with something better. We have to. I mean, that is the right thing to do. Thank you, Dr. Gray. Uh, we're going to be wrapping up here in a moment, but we have a couple of legal questions that I wanted to get in. And firstly, uh, briefly, Professor Sieg, we had this question come in from a number of different people. Is it possible that um, uh, President Biden or the federal government could move to open abortion clinics on federally owned lands in states where abortion is now prohibited by state law? Is that is that even feasible? Yeah, so there's been a bunch of, of talk and speculation uh, about this. And I, I could tell you that there was, there was a time when uh, the federal government was in the business of not just allowing uh, abortion on, on federal land and military bases, but even coercing uh, abortion. Uh, the first case that, uh, in which Justice Ginsburg, as, as a professor and lawyer, started thinking about uh, sex equality uh, was was a case called Struck Against Secretary of Defense in which she represented uh, a woman who was a nurse in the military and who was told when she got pregnant either have an abortion on the base or or you're out of the out of the military. Um, so I mean the, the federal government's relationship to abortion uh, goes back uh, goes back decades for for better and and for worse. Uh, certainly on in federal enclaves as the law calls it. Uh, uh, they, they, they would not be bound by uh, uh, state uh, uh, abortion, uh, uh, abortion restrictions if the federal government uh, wanted to provide uh, reproductive health care. But it's not something that the president could simply decide to do. There would have to be legislative uh, authority for it. And I, I'm not aware uh, that there is such authority at present. Uh, and there are also, uh, I know, various uh, federal restrictions in federal law on the use of federal funds uh, to, to obtain uh, abortions, and they might also uh, be implicated as well. So I think it's, it's a possibility, uh, but uh, uh, with the important caveat that I have not looked deeply into the matter, it's not clear to me that under current federal law, this is something that could be done as opposed to something that could be done if Congress uh, were to pass a statute uh, authorizing it. Sure, absolutely. And, and in the last couple of minutes, um, I'm going to ask you this again, because it's an outstanding legal question. Obviously, for the last um, 50 years, um, you know, the conservative movement has been moving towards this day and attempting to overturn abortion and challenging it legally in many different ways. Now, of course, we have a patchwork of state laws. Would you expect in the court system to see challenges to those state, the various state laws um, under, under particular small conditions here and there in the same way that um, the conservative movement challenged abortion uh, laws that allowed abortion. So does now the, 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 that kind of script flip? And do you expect to see a lot of ch challenges to the state laws or does that ruling on Friday by the Supreme Court kind of preclude a lot of the strategies that people may have had to, uh, to challenge those laws? Uh, I, I certainly do expect uh, a lot of litigation. Uh, I mentioned earlier uh, uh, the right to travel, which can be invoked for those who travel interstate. I mentioned the possibility of uh, a preemption argument for the interstate shipment of uh, abortion-inducing medication. Uh, a third possible legal theory that uh, is implicit in much of our conversation today is what's called vagueness challenges. Uh, the due process clauses uh, of, of the Constitution uh, protect people against vague laws, especially vague criminal laws. And if you have a statute that talks about an immediate risk to the life of the pregnant person, well, as, as the doctors have asked today, what exactly does that mean or, or impairment of a major bodily function? What exactly does that mean? I think there, uh, um, and the language of these statutes and the guidance that, are, that is offered by the states is going to matter a lot because um, it would not surprise me if a, if a number of federal courts were to decide that a number of these laws were unconstitutionally vague, uh, that uh, you can't pass a vague statute, uh, vaguely, broadly banning abortion with some exceptions that are not particularly defined, and then 
uh, doctors are a force to spin the wheel and we'll see you know, where, where it lands, whether or not they can be prosecuted. American law has never worked uh, that, well, never is a long time. It doesn't work that way anymore. And I would expect those kinds of vagueness due process challenges to endure. But, but I, I think my, my bottom line point, and maybe this will lead into uh, a future briefing, is that the, the future of reproductive health care in this country lies in politics, not, not in law. Uh, if, if you get the politics right, the law will take care of itself. Uh, this has uh, been a, a conservative political movement for decades that has uh, succeeded um, in a bunch of historically contingent ways in, in changing the law uh, through winning uh, enough elections in the White House and the Senate uh, to produce uh, a bare five justice majority that was uh, willing to do what the court just did uh, in Dobbs. And I think um, uh, politics and voting and mobilization, I think, is, um, uh, uh, is really where those who, who, who believe in, in, in the vital importance of reproductive health care need, need to focus uh, their efforts as, as doctors and, and lawyers uh, do the best they can uh, day by day, patient by patient, client by client, uh, trying to help people. Absolutely. Thank you, Professor Siegel. I think we will call it there. We will certainly be exploring the political aspects of this as well as the ongoing uh, impact on the medical system as time goes by. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks to our panelists, Dr. Beverly Gray, Dr. Jonas Swartz, Professor Neil Siegel, for sharing your expertise and perspectives on this. We uh, will certainly be hosting more briefings on this and other topics as we go along. Please do email dukenews at duke.edu if you would like to be notified about those briefings. In the meantime, please stay well, stay safe, and if you can, stay sane. Thank you very much for your time and everybody have a great day.